Amen. Amen. Nice to see you guys and gals here. And uh, for those that are up there on Facebook land that are joining us, and just pray that the word will bless each one of us. Lord, we love you. We give the honor. We give you praise. Thank you for allowing us to have a place to hang out in and to study your word. We pray that you bless the word that you would speak to our hearts and our minds. And again, we just commit all of our ways and our days to you. And uh, I, I want to lift up our friend Mary, who's in the hospital right now. We get a motorcycle benefit for her today. And we pray that you help her to heal up soon and completely. And uh, we just pray again that you would uh, just be with the people that are riding out there. And uh, just keep them safe. We just commit all these things into your hands. I pray that you'd hide me behind the cross of your word and that you would be exalted. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. Daniel chapter 6. Last time we got together, we were talking about Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar and all these different people and types. And uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about a lot of different things. Uh, it begins in verse 1. And how many of you guys ever heard the story of Daniel in the lion's den? That's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Okay? So, beginning in verse 1. It says, it pleased Darius. And just to give you a little bit of background on Darius, because we've heard about Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar and all these, those were Babylonian rulers. Uh, Darius was a Mede and Chaldean uh, leader. So here it says, it pleased Darius. And again, so the Babylonian Empire was conquered by the Medes and the Persians, who would be later conquered by the Greeks, the Grecians, after that would be the Romans, okay? So just different empires coming and going, and so we're going to be looking at a lot of that kind of stuff. But it says here, it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps. Satraps are basically princes, rulers in the Medo-Persian Empire. Because the first time I read that, satraps, what's a satrap? <laughs> Never heard of that term before. So inquiring minds want to know. So there you have it. So it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom. Again, this is the Medo-Persian kingdom. And Persia is actually an old name for what we now know as Iran. Interesting. So to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors of whom Daniel was one. And the satraps might give account to them, so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So Daniel was a very powerful, godly guy, okay? He really loved the Lord. He prayed at least three times a day. It talks about that throughout the scriptures, okay? So he spent time with God. He wanted to draw closer to God. And here it says that he had an excellent spirit. When you are filled with God, you will have an excellent spirit, amen? Amen. Because there are a lot of people that are full of something, <laughs> okay? But isn't, wouldn't it be a blessing to be full of God and the Spirit of God? It's a beautiful thing. So Daniel was one of three governors. Darius the king really thought a lot of him. In fact, he was being considered to be put in position of rulership second only to the king. And Daniel had lived a faultless life in subjection to the authority of the king. Picking it up in verse 4. It says, So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. 
Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So these guys were all jealous of Daniel because Daniel was a special guy, had a place of authority. Okay, so they basically conspired together and, you know, basically said, what can we do to this guy, Daniel, to make life miserable for him? And I don't know if you've ever felt like you were being plotted against by people, okay? But if you have, then maybe you can feel a little bit about what Daniel was going through. In Ecclesiastes, there are a few scriptures that we're going to take a look at that are very interesting. Uh, the first one is Ecclesiastes, and we're going to look at chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 4 through 6. And it basically says, this. it talks about the vanity of selfishness, okay? And in verse 4 it says again, I saw that for all toil... In every skillful work, a man is envied by his neighbor. So these guys envied Daniel, okay, because they didn't like the fact that he was getting all the props. Mm -hmm. They were not getting all the props, so that's why they were conspiring against him. Then it says this also is vanity and grasping for the wind. The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. Better a handful with quietness than both hands full together with toil and grasping for the wind. As I was reading about this grasping for the wind, I thought of my own life, okay? Before I became a Christian, I was always grasping for something, trying to find something that was going to fulfill me. How many know what I'm talking about in the room, right? Absolutely. We grasp after things thinking, if I could only get that, then I'd be happy. If I could only get that, then I'd be complete. And when we don't know the Lord, when we are just grasping at straws, okay, we're grasping for things that are never going to fulfill us anyway, okay? And I can say... Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, and found out that I didn't really want the t-shirt, <laughs> okay? Because a lot of us have gone through those kind of things, grasping for the wind, trying to get something that we think is going to fulfill us. But Daniel, like his king Jesus, was pretty faultless, okay? It, it says that he was a pretty faultless guy. And in John chapter 19, it speaks to that. So I want to go over there for a minute. In John chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, this is when Jesus was being mocked and went before Pilate and all of that. Okay? So then, this John chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, it says, So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. So, Daniel was kind of like a type and symbol of Jesus and being somebody that nobody could find any fault with. Okay, it's pretty powerful. So going back to Daniel chapter 6, we're going to pick it up in verse 6. And it says, So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. That was a basic suck-up move. <laughs> okay? Oh, King, you're, you're all out in a bag of chips, and we're all about you. Live forever. And so they were basically sucking up to the king. And, it, and they said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together 
to establish a royal statute and to make a firm degree that whoever petitions any god, and you notice that's a lowercase g, so that's false gods, right? And it says, whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days, except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Pretty radical. Yeah. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Okay, so they thronged the king when they were trying to gather together evidence against Daniel. They figured, we're never going to catch this guy in anything. He's pretty faultless. He doesn't do anything wrong, except he likes to pray to his God. So let's make a decree that nobody can pray to their God or confer with any man, okay? And again, they were kissing up to the king, and then they came up with the idea that Dan they knew Daniel wouldn't like this at all. They said, gee, king, why don't you make a decree that no one can petition a god or a man for 30 days, except you, O king. In other words, again, suck it up, right? <laughs> we don't want them to pray to any man, any god. They don't want them to consort with any man, all of the above. And they thought, what a great idea. Everyone will have to go through you for everything. And these guys were total snakes because they knew that Daniel prayed to his God three times a day. So they knew that sooner or later, Daniel would violate this new ordinance. And they also didn't bother to tell Daniel about this. <laughs> okay. So they didn't talk to him about the decree. They're just talking to the king. And the decree was a really stupid one. For example, people couldn't ask each other for help or favors. <laughs> For 30 days, since all requests were to be made to the king. So you couldn't borrow a cup of sugar from your neighbor. You couldn't ask them for anything. Okay? And maybe that's not a bad idea. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay? But they couldn't ask anybody or anything or couldn't even ask of their gods. Okay? And poor old King Darius apparently succumbed to the flattery of the princes without thinking through the effects of the decree. Because with the signing of this decree, it also meant that no one could pray to their God. Right. So if you prayed, if you petitioned your God, then you'd be thrown into the lion's den. Right. So this evening's chapter actually has applications to the future as well. You guys knew that was coming. So, in Revelation, chapter 13, this is the, the text about the mark of the beast and all of that. Okay, so we're going to pick it up in verse 15, Revelation chapter 13. And it says, he, and it's talking about the false prophet, the antichrist, and the dragon. And it says, he, the false prophet, was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, who is the Antichrist, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Okay. So in the last ruling empire, there will come the great tribulation period. We all know about that. Okay. We've discussed that many times here at Rushing Wind. And... The last ruling empire is going to come during the tribulation period. The Antichrist will make believe that he's a friend of the Jews and tell them that they can worship their God in their temple, that he, he allows them to rebuild, 
okay? But then in the middle of the seven year great tribulation, in the middle, after 1,290 days or three and a half years or 48 months, it all breaks down to the same thing, three and a half years, okay? At that point, the Antichrist is going to go into the temple and he's going to say, guess what? I'm really glad that we're, we've all gathered here together because you're not going to worship your God anymore. Now you're going to worship me. Hmm. And that is called the abomination that, that causes desolation. So, basically, it's the same thing that Daniel was going through. Okay, because when he, when he heard that he couldn't worship his God anymore, he couldn't pray to his God anymore, or he would be thrown into a den of lions, <clears throat> that was not a deal breaker for him. Okay, and so much like that, because during the Great Tribulation, they're going to be telling people that you have to take the mark of the, of the beast, and if you don't, they will chop off your head. Okay, and you know, if, if I was around during that time, I would say, let her roll. <laughs> okay, if I got to have my head chopped off to be okay with the real God, that's what I'd do, okay? And you know, I, I talked to young people, and I had, I had a couple of young guys one time that I was talking to, and they said, yeah, you know, we're, we're not all about the Jesus thing, and if the Antichrist comes, then we won't take the mark of the beast. I said, bro, I got news for you. If you don't have enough guts to live for Jesus now, you will not have enough guts to die for him later. And they, they didn't know what to say when I said that. But it was, it's basically the same kind of thing. You bow down and worship him or his image, or you are put to death. So, now let's go back to Daniel chapter 6, because like I said, those, the, the scriptures in Daniel intertwine with the scriptures in the book of Revelation, and it's like a big jigsaw puzzle, and it all fits together as you look at the big picture. Picking up in verse 10, it says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home, and in his upper room, with the wind, his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. So Daniel wasn't having it, okay? They said, you cannot pray to your God. And he said, I'm going to obey God. I'm going to pray to my God. If you do whatever you got to do, I'm still going to pray to my God. And guess what? If we were given that choice, isn't that what we would do? Absolutely. Because guess what? If Christianity is ever outlawed, I'm going to be an outlaw again. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. I used to be an outlaw biker. I used to be pretty hardcore. All that. But if Christianity is ever outlawed, I'm going to be an outlaw. Just letting you know. And many of you in the room would do the same thing. Because we would choose to obey God rather than men. In the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 5, we're going to go over there. Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 26. It says, Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence. Talking about the disciples. For they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name, the name of Jesus? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter said, and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. And guess what? At some point in the game, it may come down to that. Okay? If they say we cannot worship God, we cannot. And, you know, back, back when I was growing up, Christianity was thought of pretty well. Okay? And, you know, our country was founded on Christian principles. Most families 
had they would go to church together they would have meals together they would pray all those kind of things the the world was quite a bit more innocent back then than it is now and now christians are ridiculed christians are harassed we are called names <laughs> okay and, and you know if you believe and i i was listening to this the other day i was listening to charlie kirk and uh a bunch of different people and they were basically saying that if you believe in god okay especially the trinity the father the son and the holy spirit you believe that jesus is the only way to get to heaven you believe all these things then they basically say now that you may be a christian nationalist and that's a nasty word okay it basically means that that's all that we're about, and we're going to rebel, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and all of that. And guess what? In, in some ways, we are going to be Christian nationalists. If we would rebel against a government that is so far out of touch with God, right? How many of you are with me? <laughs> You'd probably rebel just a little bit, right? And so, anyway, if they told you you couldn't worship God anymore... You could not pray to God anymore. You could not do all of these things. There comes a point mm -hmm. where we would have to stand up and say, I'm going to obey God rather than men. And you know, every time I watch TV and I watch the news, and I see them coming up with more wacky laws and, you know, and proclamations, and uh, most of the things that they come up with are anti-God. It's, it's absolutely amazing. It blows my mind, okay? And so, you know, at some point in the game, we would have to, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and believers in the Word of God, and obeying what the Bible says, and all of that, we would have to say, you know what? Enough's enough. Okay? It doesn't mean I'm telling everybody, this is for the lack of the uh, those that are watching with cameras and, you know, trying to find Pastor Z saying something terrible. I'm not telling people, Christians, run up and raise up your arms, go kill people. I would never say that. But I will say, I will say that if you are a believer, there is a time coming when it's going to hit the fan and you're going to have to decide... Are you going to obey God? Or are you going to obey people? Right? So I, I have to say that. As a pastor, I have to say, like the disciples, are you going to obey man? Or are you going to obey God? And the answer is pretty obvious. We would have to obey God. And not obey men. So, uh, <laughs> it's a top priority as a believer. To obey God instead of men. Because men have wacky laws. And women don't want to leave them out. Okay? <laughs> Especially with the uh, political climate going. <laughs> okay? Men and women have wacky laws that they come up with. Terrible ideas. Okay? And so, anyway. So now let's go back to... I want you to think about it. Because it would be pretty intense. If they said that you could not worship God. God. And could it ever get to a point like that? I'm glad I asked. <laughs> okay? Because in Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, this is talking about people actually having their heads cut off because they are not going to worship the beast. So let's take a look at that. In Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, it says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him. Isn't that a blessing that at some point in the game, God is going to shut up the devil? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that. It says, in it, he, will, he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him, 
Somebody should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years were finished, but after these things he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Here's the kicker. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for, for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So the people that stand up to the Antichrist and will not take his mark, many will be beheaded. That's pretty intense stuff, right? And you know, I don't know about you, but uh, in the last few years, I saw videos that were on the news of believers over in Muslim countries that were being beheaded for their faith right there on the beach. And I was going, wow, this is pretty intense. Because it does go back to what it says in the Word of God. That sometimes if people, and, and i got to tell you the difference between some of them and some of us, okay? Because most of the people that were in those kind of situations, they're pacifists, okay? They did not fight back. But guess what? There are some Christians who would fight back, okay? So I want you to think about that for a minute, right? <laughs> because if they came up to me and they said, oh, by the way, we're going to cut off your head, we're going to cut off your wife's head, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, I'd go... Not without a fight. <laughs> I'm just like, you know, because Americans, some of us are very patriotic and we believe in our rights and we are not just going to bow and let them chop off our heads without a fight. I'm just saying. How many would probably stand up? No, oh, I, I, I thought there were a couple other guys and gals in the room that might want to just, you know, go, here, lob it off. <laughs> I'm going to put it... I'm just going to bow down and, you know, some of us wouldn't do that. We would fight back. And I believe that that's an important thing to consider. But again, Daniel was a man of prayer. He prayed throughout the day as problems or blessings came up. And he also had an appointed time and place to pray three times a day. And Daniel praised God as he prayed. And you know what? Praise should, of course, be a part of our prayer life, okay? That we should praise God, we should thank God for who He is, for what He does, all of the above. And in the Gospel of Matthew, we're going to go over there for a minute, and, you know, like I said, we, we like to hop around the Bible on Sunday nights and take a look at a bunch of different scriptures. I think it's, I think it's powerful, because I would rather give you scriptures than my opinion. Okay, and there are a lot of teachers that just ramble on, tell stories, and they give you, a, you know, a million opinions and whatnot, but they don't get into the Word of God. And I think the Word of God is more important than anything that I've got to say. So in Matthew chapter 6, we're going to begin in verse 9. Matthew chapter 6, we'll begin in verse 9. i got to make sure I'm in the right area here. Yep, 9 through 13 here. Okay, it says, In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is actually praising God and thanking God that he is our God, our Father in heaven. Amen? And I believe that should be part of our prayer life. Then he says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, 
but deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen that is praying and praising god at the same time okay you know most of the most of the time when people pray and this is just a general statement but most of the time when we pray we pray when we are under pressure <laughs> okay i don't know about you how many have prayed more when you're under pressure <laughs> and when you're not under pressure you pray more because you're going through something that's intense something that's hardcore so you are crying out to god you're asking god for something <laughs> And there's nothing wrong with asking God to meet our needs. And you know what? God is, in, is interested in our needs. But we should also thank him. We should praise him. We should give him the honor and the glory that he is due. And to give thanks often. And in the book of Psalms. In the book of Psalms, in Psalm 55... Verses 16 through 17, it says, As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. I don't know about you, but a lot of times we need to be connected. Amen? We need to be connected to the Lord. We need to pray when we're going through stuff. And uh, just ask God for his help. Amen? And that can be the most spiritual prayer that you ever pray. Help! <laughs> okay? When you are crying out to God, he hears you. And he listens. And that's a blessing. All right. Picking it back up. In Daniel chapter 6. In verse 11. This is where it starts getting intense. Yeah. It says, Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Now, like I said, this king liked Daniel. <laughs> At this point in the game, he was probably going, Uh-oh, I stepped in it. <laughs> okay? Because my, my buddy Daniel was praying... <coughs> And now I am stuck because of a law that I signed. Boy, I bet that was a bitter pill to swallow, right? So the wicked kings probably gathered in the inner courtyard of Daniel's house to spy on him. Like I said earlier, they knew he would be praying, so they snooped around and caught him conversing with his God, which was part of his lifestyle. Okay, that was part of what he did on a daily basis. So, in verse 11, it says, Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying. How did they find him praying? Because they were looking. Yeah. <laughs> they were waiting. They knew that he would be praying. Okay? And the king said, That's true. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> right? That's probably what he was thinking. Picking it up in verse 13. It says, so they answered and said before the king that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. What a terrible thing, <laughs> right? And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself. Right. He was like, oh. Uh, I can't believe I fell for that. Right? And set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. And 
What was a drag is because he could not change or alter the law. You know what? Some laws need to be changed. <laughs> Hello? Some laws need to be altered. It's a real drag when you go, okay, it's locked in stone. This can never be changed. Verse 15. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, No, O king, that is the law of the Medes and Persians, that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. What a powerful thing for that yeah. king to say, right? Yeah. Because he's going, you know what? There's something about you, buddy. And I think you're praying to the right God. <laughs> and I think your God is going to deliver you. That's pretty powerful for a, a heathen king to say something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring mm -hmm. and with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. What's interesting about that? It says that it was that he put a seal on the stone, mm -hmm. just like when Jesus right. was buried. Okay, mm -hmm. they rolled out a stone. And they saw that the signet ring was on the stone. Okay? And if anybody broke that seal, they would be put to death. The guards would be put to death. So it's kind of like a typing symbol. Okay, as Daniel is going into the lion's den, they put a big boulder in front of it. They put a signet ring on it and stamped it and said, nobody else can mess with this. Same way, when Jesus died and was buried, and they put him in a tomb, put the stone, put the signet ring, don't mess with this, right? Guess who has the ability to mess with it? God! <laughs> right? Yeah. Anyway, I thought that was kind of cool. Picking it up in verse 18, it says, Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. Also, his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions. Verse 21. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. <laughs> okay? So he's saying it in a totally different way. He's not sucking up to the king. He's saying, hey, guess what, king? I'm still here. <laughs> My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths so that they have not heard me. Because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So, he might have thought, just possibly, <laughs> I better find out if this guy's still alive, right? <laughs> I mean, that's what it sounds like to me. Daniel, are you in there? Did your God really deliver you? Are you okay? And I'm sure they were still hoping that his God was able to deliver him. And you know what's interesting? Is there are a couple of scriptures where it talks about that God is very able to deliver us. Uh, in fact, in Romans chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 20 through 21. Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 20. And it says, He did not waver at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced 
that what he had promised he was able to perform. I want you to think about that, okay? In your own life, in your own situation, when you pray to God, when you ask God to help you, do you believe that God is able to do anything? That's the kind of faith that we need to have, church. Amen? We need to have that kind of faith that if we pray and we ask God and we are crying out and we are praying in the will of God, I may add, okay? We're not praying selfishly. We are praying in the will of God. God is able to come through, isn't he? Every time. I want to read this again. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Aren't you glad that you serve a God that's able to perform? <laughs> he's able to help. He's able to deliver. He's able to do whatever you need him to do. I got to tell you, man, that's the kind of God I want to believe in. <laughs> okay? A lot of people believe in wacky gods that is not that are not able to perform. Also in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20, it says, "Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, According to the power that works in us. Beyond what we could ask or think. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've said this before. I've prayed before and I've asked God for certain things. Sometimes he doesn't answer my prayers in the ways that I think he should answer them. Yeah. But then they turn out to be exactly what I needed. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I want to read that again. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think, according to the power that works in us. What power works in us? The power of the Holy Spirit. This is powerful stuff. <laughs> we got to know that we know that we know. And Daniel answers, O king, live forever. My God sent his angels. And they must have had some really good super glue. Because <laughs> they glued their mouths shut. My God shut the mouth of the lions. And you know what? Lions with no teeth <laughs> are not a big deal, right? <laughs> lions with teeth and with mouths open, you'd be in major fear. Okay? Here he says, my God shut the mouth of the lions. Mm -hmm. So far. God sent his angels and they delivered me. Isn't that powerful? And in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, another powerful verse, in verses 32 through 40, it talks about the things that God can do. Here it says, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, Escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle. Turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might still, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had Trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. 
They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. This is talking about the prophets, right? God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So all the prophets went through stuff, okay? And they were all found faithful, even unto death. That's hardcore. Again, very hardcore. And Daniel was not harmed because of one thing. Guess what it was? Because he believed in his God. Right? Daniel chapter 6, picking it up in verse 23. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatsoever. Whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. That's an important part of the puzzle, isn't it? We got to believe in our God. We got to have faith. Not just wimpy faith either. <laughs> it's got to be bold faith. Bold faith that stands in the face of lions. Amen? So powerful. Verse 24. Look at what happens to the guys that set them up. This is awesome. <laughs> okay, not awesome for them, by the way. <laughs> it says, and the king gave the command. And they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions. Uh, yes. Then their children, their wives, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. I hate it when that happens, okay? But basically, and you know, a lot of times people read stuff in the Bible and they go, why did God allow that, right? Sometimes it's a generational thing. He took all of them, their wives, their children, tossed them all to the lions. And this is not God doing it. This is King Darius doing it, number one. But guess what? It also stopped any future generations from these people from doing that again. I'm just letting you know, okay? I mean, as you think it through, wiped out the entire genealogy. Okay, of these satraps. In verse 25 it says, Then King Darius wrote, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. So this made a believer out of the king, didn't it? Because now he's saying, you know what? <laughs> There's one God, <laughs> the God of Daniel. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed in his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Okay, so again, this king made a decree, okay? That this God of Daniel is an awesome God, right? Pretty powerful. He is a living God. His kingdom will last forever. He delivers and rescues. And so my question is tonight is, has anybody ever been rescued by God? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just a few times, right? <laughs> Just a few times, right? And Daniel, like I said, was not just a historical figure. He was also a type and symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ, who after being cast out to death, the tomb was sealed, and yet he still arose to life. 
Isn't that powerful? Mm -hmm. Okay. So a lot of times when we read stuff in the Old Testament, it absolutely connects with the New Testament as well. Daniel also symbolizes the 144,000 Jews from the book of Revelation. And in Revelation chapter 7, I'm going to go over there for a minute. And Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, it says, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or the sea, or on the sea, sorry, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And you notice, it's a living God, right? And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And we read some weeks ago that there were 12 tribes, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, and that too makes up the 144,000. And I got one more scripture for you, and then we are out of here. And Jeremiah... Jeremiah chapter 10, this speaks about the God who is real, who delivers, and who is living. Jeremiah chapter 10, beginning in verse 10. It says, the Lord is the true God. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King and his wrath. At his wrath, the earth will tremble, and the nations will not be able to endure his indignation. Thus you shall say to them, the gods, lowercase g, that have not made the heavens and the earth, shall perish from this earth and from under these heavens. He, capital H, with the real God, has made the earth by his power, he has established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. So there are a lot of false gods there's only one real God. <laughs> and he's the God that we need to know, the God that we need to serve, and the God that we need to believe in and trust in, because he is able to deliver. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, again, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the promises that are in it. Help us to trust in you, to believe in you, to know that you are the real living God. And that you can be counted upon. And so, Lord, we, we're thankful that we know you as our Lord and Savior. If there's anybody out there that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, we pray that they would ask you to come into their hearts, into their lives, and to be their God. To be their Savior and to be their Lord. And so we pray for those that are out there that don't know you, that you would touch them, that you would draw them that you would let them know that you care for them, that you sent your son to die for their sins. And Lord, we love you again. Thank you for your word this evening. As we go, may we go in the peace of Jesus. And just to know the comfort and the love that you have for us, God. You're such an amazing God. And we love you. We give you honor. We give you praise in Jesus' name.